analysis of the fall. How has it gone? Are your players healthy and ready to go? Well, I think, Todd, that we're, uh, we're relatively healthy, but uh, one thing that uh, you never know is exactly how they're going to respond once they take the turf uh, for real. Uh, certainly, uh, we've had some minor bumps and bruises this, this fall that have taken players out of uh, action for a period of time. Uh, we did get Ricky Whittle back, which makes it nice at the tailback spot. Donovan Moore probably won't be able to play this week because of the ankle injury he sustained. But by and large, we're relatively healthy. Uh, the big loss, of course, was Eric Castle's uh, case of mononucleosis, and he will be out for probably three or four games at least, and uh, that is a big loss. Last year, uh, one of the big concerns uh, as the season progressed, the injuries, and as the injuries mounted, it seemed offensively uh, were unable to put points on the board. Do you feel that the, the players that were injured are back to where they were a year ago, maybe even better? Well, I don't think there's any question that the players are healthier. Uh, I think more confident than certainly we were at the end of the season. And I think there's been a lot more competition, so their level of play, if they've remained starters, uh, is going to be better than it was at the uh, middle part of the end of the season last year. And uh, it certainly has to be because we were not a very good football team by the end of the year, and that was fairly obvious to everybody. Well, during the course of the show, we'll take a look at the offense, the defense, all facets of the game. But first, this is the coach's 16th season with the Ducks, tying him with Len Casanova for the longest tenure in years at the U of O. Walt Fox has a closer look at the coach and the men that he works with. 16 years is a long time to do anything. Coaching the same college football team for that long is almost unheard of. But this is season number 16 for Rich Brooks at Oregon. For the winning team, Brooks has seen good times and bad times with the Ducks. He's the only coach to lead Oregon to back-to-back -back bowl games. And although his overall record is under 500, his teams are 47 and 44 over the last eight seasons. Brooks and the Ducks don't get a lot of national attention. However, they haven't gone unnoticed. This summer, one national publication rated Brooks as one of the top 10 coaches in the country and called his staff the best in the Pac-10. Through the hands, here we go. Pass it. Linebacker coach Bill Taro and Brooks go way back. In fact, Taro hired Brooks Good. as an assistant when he was a high school coach down in California. He knew Brooks wouldn't be a high school coach for long. He was ambitious and he wanted to go on and, and uh, he had his goal set and I, you know, I, I knew he was a great coach. Taro was one of the first assistants Brooks hired when he got the job at Oregon. Come on, Troy, stay down, get down, down. That's it. No, Joe Schaffeld was already at Oregon on, when Brooks arrived in 1977. That's it. That's he says one of the down, things that makes Brooks such a good coach is his competitive nature. He helped the players and coaches remain competitive, and I think uh, I think that's kind of what 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 his standards are, the competitiveness that, that he goes by. <laughs> Steve Greatwood is the only current assistant coach who also played for Brooks. He says Brooks has mellowed a bit over the years and has gotten closer to his players. And Brooks showed a lot of confidence in him when he made that jump from player to coach. He went out of his way to make me feel comfortable. And the one thing he's always done is, is uh, display his confidence in you as a coach. And, uh, you know, Rich will be, he'll be demanding, but he's always been fair. And that's all you can expect from anyone that's your superior. Too high. Too high. He's coming up. Can't do that. Shut Six of the Ducks' assistant coaches have been at Oregon for at least 10 years. They say working for Brooks is a big reason why. He gives everyone a job to do, and they have to take care of it. That's one of the good things about working for him is that you don't have someone looking over your shoulder all the time. When you're given a job to do, you're expected to do it, and he gives you that opportunity. You made it exciting. That was too exciting. Well, Coach, uh, 16 seasons, and uh, now uh, football isn't enough for you. You uh, are going to add the title of athletic director come October 1st. you got a full menu up here. Well, maybe so, Todd. Gee, those coaches were so nice in their praise. Maybe they're figuring they're going to get a raise now that I also have the athletic director. Controlling title, a so. purse string. Does <laughs> I don't know, but uh, uh, yeah, it, it is going to be an interesting challenge. Uh, the football season alone is, is a major challenge, Todd, but uh, the new duties... Uh, and made more difficult probably by the guy I have to follow because Bill Byrne has done a remarkable job of bringing in his eight years uh, this program to the forefront of uh, national prominence, facility improvement, competitiveness on the field in all sports. Uh, it's, a, it's a big uh, big act to follow and uh, the good news is however that he's, he's, it's a lot better job now than when he took over so uh, maybe it won't be quite as difficult as it was when he took it over. Well, we'll see what happens. The Ducks, of course, 
Want to put a lot more points on the board th this year than they did a year ago? When we come back, we'll take a look at the offense. Sometimes you wish they would never end. The Kelly Show is just a right. special. Friends know when to say when. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Uh, we'll talk about a lot of the uh, things that you'll see this uh, season in the course of the upcoming three months. But first of all, we want to talk about the offense. After several seasons amongst the conference leaders offensively, the Ducks slipped last year. Seven players returned who started at least five games, including a couple of key players that suffered through injury-riddled seasons. In baseball, when a hitter goes five for five, he's had a great day. But a year ago, the Ducks went five for five at the quarterback position. During a five-week stretch in midseason, a time when teams are making their postseason pitch, the Ducks started a different pitcher each week. The results were predictable, an offense that was unable to generate much of anything, including victories. Danny O'Neill was the starter during the first five games when the Ducks were three and two. Among the victories, impressive offensive outings against Washington State and Texas Tech. O'Neill is back for his second season after a dislocated thumb. He believes many a lesson was learned a year ago. I think the number one thing I learned was uh, was the different variables that could get thrown at you. Uh, the, the, the problems that could come at you that, that you can't prepare for in practice that just come in the game. And uh, I think I know those things and I'm prepared for those things so they're not going to happen to me. When healthy, O'Neill connected for seven touchdown passes, including a school record tying four at Texas Tech. Just as important to the offense is tailback Sean Burwell. When healthy, he is a potential 1,000-yard rusher. But a variety of injuries have reduced his effectiveness during his first two seasons. This summer, he joined linebacker Ernest Jones in an aggressive weightlifting program and has pronounced himself in the best shape of his life. I, know I started back in spring. I kind of got hurt in spring. And then uh, me and Ernest Jones, we worked out most of the summer, the whole summer, every day, and uh, made some gains in my strength, got a little bit bigger. And I just came in here ready to do it. In two preseason scrimmages, Burwell has displayed the slashing quickness and speed that made him one of the top freshmen in the country two years ago. But depth is critical at running back, where there are only four guys who have taken a snap in a Division I game. Depth is no problem at wide receiver. Incumbents Ronnie Harris and Anthony Jones are being pushed by J.C. transfer Derek Deadweiler and several redshirt freshmen. Deadweiler, for one, is capable of returning the big play to the Oregon offense. We need to have better effort, I think. Consistency and effort, going after big balls, making big plays. Like you said, we did some of that in the beginning of the season, and then things kind of fell off, and, and we did those receiver core as well. So we're looking for big plays and consistency. A mix of veterans and newcomers dots the line. Four of five interior linemen tip the scales at 280 pounds or more, but the big change is in formation. Instead of left side, right side, there is now strong side, quick side. It's working out good. It's kind of made it so we can just come off the ball a lot harder and uh, not having to worry about so much the calls, just so we can come off and play some smash, smash mouth football. Traditionally, during fall drills, the offense is a little behind the defense, but in the last four opening day assignments, the Ducks have averaged over 41 points a game. With a little fine-tuning, offensive coordinator Mike Bellotti believes that can happen again. I think two things. Obviously, not turning the ball over. Um, Hawaii is a very explosive offense. We want to control the football. Uh, we've got to eliminate the center quarterback exchange problems that we had today. And, and again, part of that is playing three or four different quarterbacks and three or four different centers. Uh, but that's got to eliminate itself. Uh, other than that, I think just uh, re reinfuse some confidence in the team and the crowd that we're going to score some points. I know you'd like to see some points on the board this year. Your assessment of uh, Danny O'Neill, you have announced he's going to be the starter Saturday against Hawaii, his fall camp. I think he's had a very consistent fall camp, Todd. He's uh, performed very well, uh, has regained the strength he lost uh, from the thumb surgery last fall, uh, couldn't lift all last winter, so when he, in the spring his arm strength wasn't what it was uh, in the previous fall, and he is, he's back to normal, I'd say, throwing the ball well, making good decisions, and uh, I think he's ready to uh, lead a rejuvenated offense, and uh, believe me, it needs to be rejuvenated. Well, Danny, last year was 3-2 and two as a starter before he went down with that thumb injury, and if 
he picks up where he left off, the Ducks will be in good business. When we come back, we'll take a look at the defense, so stick with us. He's 6'6", 285 pounds. He eats quarterbacks for lunch. The only person he loves is his mother. There are 40 guys on the team just like him. There are 28 teams in the league. Now, who's gonna win? You're a bubble of plum. You're a bubble of plum. There's a screw loose somewhere. Somewhere. Your elevator doesn't quite make it to the highest floor. To the highest floor. These days, if you work in the wood products industry and you don't join the credit union, you're not just going backward financially. You're getting soaked. Wood Products Credit Union. If you don't join, you're out of your tree. You're out of your tree. Dudes, when battling the foot, my motto is keep your feet planted, except, of course, when you're in the air. Which brings us to the Turtle Bubble Bomber. Our Bubble Bomber drops smoke-filled bubble bombs. Boom! A really awesome jet with really awesome bombs. And that brings us to another great vehicle, the Sewer Sand Cruiser. Turrets rotate, makes gunfire sounds, that'll get the foot flying. So, dudes, remember, a good turtle general never finds himself in the soup. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I hate soup jokes. On the first edition of Northwest Reports, how might one tiny Northwest Eye Clinic hurt healthcare in other Northwest towns? Why have these two Northwest families put their lives on the line to protect the Kurds from Saddam Hussein? Meet the man who invented the soul that runs the road and makes the money that started the house of Nike. Those stories and more on Northwest Reports, Tuesday night at 9 on KPTV 12. Well, now it's time to take a look at the defense. Despite a rash of injuries and too much playing time on the field last year, the defense still managed to finish among the conference leaders. Walt Fox has a closer look. Staying healthy will be the number one goal for the Oregon defense this season. Last year, because of injuries, only two guys started every game at the same position, and they both graduated. The good news is all the injuries allowed the Ducks to get a lot of other players in the game. So despite the fact that they've lost six starters, they return a lot of experience. They realize from last year, hey, you got to be ready at any time. So let's, uh, let's see if we can work hard and get it done. The Ducks should be tough up front with ends Jeff Cummins and Romeo Bandison. Gary Williams is the top backup. Salia Malapai could be the key to the line as he takes over at nose tackle. Joe Farwell is a three-year starter at linebacker. John Tomo Peao will start at the other inside position. Ernest Jones and Terrell Edwards will start outside. But the Ducks also have some young guys that will see action, like redshirt freshman Jeremy Asher and Rich Rule. They might be short on experience, but the coaches have faith they'll come through. We want to recruit them when we didn't think they could play college football. But, uh, um, yeah, sometimes it's scary. Injury-wise, uh, especially after last year, injuries scare the hell out of us. <laughs> The situation at safety is no laughing matter. With senior All-American Eric Castle out for the first five weeks of the season because of mononucleosis. Chad Cota and Paul Rodriguez will start, but it leaves the Ducks a little thin. Cornerback is another matter. Herman O'Berry started most of last season, and Mingo Hosey is back after a redshirt year. He might be the Ducks' best cover guy. On top of that, Oregon has a load of new guys whose names you'll want to remember. Now we got some really good young kids. Alex Molden's going to be a real good football player. Eugene Jackson, Isaac Walker, uh, and Marcus Woods' younger brother, Lamont Woods, is going to be a very good one. One stat the Ducks need to improve on this year is turnover margin. They turned it over a lot more than they took it away last year. If they can improve on that and stay healthy, it could be a good year for the Oregon defense. For the Oregon Football Preview Show, I'm Walt Fox. Now, speaking of uh, turnovers and turnover margin, we have a new rule in college football this year where defenses can now advance all fumbles, whether they're beyond the line of scrimmage or behind the line of scrimmage. What kind of an effect do you see that having? Well, if it has any close to effect that it's had in our fall scrimmages, uh, we're going to score some points because our defense has scored, uh, I think, three, maybe four touchdowns on fumble recovery, scooping the ball up and running it in for a score. Uh, 
There's no question it's going to have a dramatic impact on the outcomes of games in college football this year, Todd. It's a, it's a good rule change. It, what it does is it brings that rule in line with the NFL and high school football. And uh, college has been the only one for years that you couldn't advance a fumble if you were a defensive player. Last year, they, uh, they let you advance the ones that were fumbled on the defensive side of the line of scrimmage. Now they've gone full circle and let you uh, advance the ones no matter where they are. If the quarterback gets hit, sacked, ball comes out, defensive line picks it up, runs it in for the touch, easy six. I be, hope we get the easy six. <laughs> there are going to be a lot of defensive linemen now that uh, will fulfill their lifelong dreams, and that is to score with a fumble recovery. Hopefully it will happen a lot for the Ducks. When we come back, we'll take a look at the kicking game, in particular one guy who's handling both the punting and the kicking. Okay, so these guys may know a little more than we do about Bud. It's, it's the rice. It's the hops. It's the rice. But of course, we know a lot about other things. Hi, can you buy something to drink? Yeah, like maybe a light beer? Budweiser. Or uh, maybe you'd like a Bud. Someday, boy, you're gonna learn from your mistakes. Some stores give you a peek at low prices. Raise them when you're ready to buy. Then look for new ways to lure you in. But at Buy Mart, you can count on low prices every time you shop. All Bono sunglasses are 40% off manufacturer's list price every day. And Huffy 26-inch 18-speed stone mountain bikes are just $139.99 every day. So open your eyes to Buy Mart's everyday low prices. Then beat the high cost of living every day. I couldn't get this tune out of my head till I heard these flowers, then a heartbeat, and the sound of mushrooms sprouting. It was raining cats and dogs in harmony. Then airplanes hit the high notes. Even the stars came out to play. Hey, I think I just wrote a song. Mario Paint. Draw and make music only on the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. It's your clothes you need to change, it's your pencils. Yikes! Yikes are the only pencils as unique as you. Yikes are pencils and erasers with outrageous shapes and colors that go straight to the core. Because you can't look sharp with dull pencils. Sorry, Dad. Yikes can't work miracles. They write like other pencils, but they make you go, yikes! Well, it has been about 15 years since one person has handled both the punting and the place-kicking chores for the Ducks. Pat McGilvery has more on a guy that's going to do that this year, Junior Tommy Thompson. Tommy Thompson has taken the heat for two years, ignoring the oncoming rush as Oregon's punter. But he's about to really step into the fire, punting and place kicking for the Ducks. Thompson doesn't seem overwhelmed by this new responsibility. He did it all in high school and says he's been looking forward to getting a shot at place kicking again. The chance to score is especially appealing, instead of always punting the ball away. So I like to get, put points on the board. That's just more exciting, you know, punting, you know, it's just kind of, you know, get out there, kick it, and get back to the sideline. The extra points a little more exciting. Oregon hasn't had just one player handle both jobs in years. They're different specialties, each requiring its own fundamentals. Even Thompson admits to the difficulties involved in mastering the two positions. Punting and kicking are two very separate things. The kicking motion is so different, and that's what's so hard about doing both because it's hard to stay focused on both of them because, you know, the swings kind of affect each other. And uh, so you really got to concentrate that much harder. Concentrating doesn't seem to be a big problem for Thompson as long as his teammates just leave him alone before a kick. But Tommy may have a problem when it comes to the power of positive thinking, or in his case, the power of negative thinking. You're always thinking about the bad side of it, never the good side of it. You know, you get out there and, and uh, you're sort of kicking the ball and, you know, thinking about the shank rather than the good punt. Instead of like in the field goal, you get out there and, you know, you tend to think about what if I miss instead of what if I make. Thompson says almost every kicker he's met from football camps as a little kid on up to college campuses thinks the same way. 
If he should struggle with the field goals or extra points, walk-on sophomore Eric Johansson and freshman Paul Burton are the backups. An injury has slowed Burton, but he's seen as Oregon's kicker of the future. Give me about a year, I think, here, and, uh, and I'll be ready to go. It's gonna, it's tough to say what I'll be able to do this year, but I think next year there'll be a real difference in my ability. I think uh, I'm gonna improve a lot this year, you know, sitting behind Tommy, learning from him, you know, getting my strengths together, finding out, you know, what's good for me and what's bad. But for now, Thompson will have double duty, meaning he'll be busy tying and untying his shoe. He punts with a shoe. It's less painful and he's more consistent. But Thompson place kicks barefooted to get more lift on the ball. He's almost completely overcome the pain of going shoeless. If it's freezing outside, you know, of course I'm gonna feel feel something, but I've got it to where it's so so numb and you know it's got some calluses on it, so you know I really don't feel too much. He'll be feeling good soon enough if those field goals start going through on Saturday afternoons. For the Oregon Football Preview Show, I'm Pat McGilvery. So Tommy last year uh, maybe didn't have quite the year he did as a freshman when he was uh, you know, honored by on the All-Pac-10 team. Uh, but now with two roles, uh, you think he'll be able to handle that pretty well? I'm confident he will, Todd. Uh, certainly uh, last year uh, he really did punt exceptionally well. His average wasn't all that outstanding because he was punting opponents inside their 20 and inside the 10 on a regular basis. Uh, but he is a very good field goal kicker as well. He's accurate. Uh, he's been very long this past week. He had uh, an exceptional week doing both punting and place kicking. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, he's going to have a, a miss here or there, but uh, he's going to be an outstanding, and I mean outstanding, uh, kicker and punter. Uh, I, I'm just uh, really excited to, to watch him perform. Hopefully he'll knock a bunch of those through, although I'm sure you'd like to have the touchdowns and rather have him kick a lot of extra points instead of the field goals. When we come back, we'll uh, take a look at uh, what it's like in training camp during the fall. So stick with us. Mark and Rennie and little Lindsay are a young family just starting out. They don't have a lot of money for life insurance. I'm their State Farm agent, Gaylord Mooseman. Instead of giving Mark and Rennie a big life insurance sales talk, I did a lot of listening. And we came up with a plan that's going to work for their budget and little Lindsay's future, too. State Farm agents are good listeners because we want you to have life insurance you can live with. State Farm sells life insurance. He's 6'6", 285 pounds. He eats quarterbacks for lunch. The only person he loves is his mother. There are 40 guys on the team just like him. There are 28 teams in the league. Now, who's gonna win? It's fun, sun, and much more. Join David Hasselhoff for the Baywatch Summerfest. A look into the life on Southern California's hottest and most exciting beaches. And a behind-the-scenes tour of the making of Baywatch. You'll meet new cast members Pamela Anderson, David Chervais, Alexander Paul, Nicole Eggert, and Kelly Slater. Don't miss the Baywatch Summerfest. It's much more than just another day at the beach. Get a little closer to Baywatch today at 4 on KPTV 12. On a devastated ship. Enterprise, extend shields. Two lives vanish into thin air. Where are they? Leaving only one tragic conclusion. You're dead, Jordy. They're caught in a ghostly limbo. It's like I'm here, but I'm not here. Faced with a threat from beyond the grave. Do not move. Row! Ah! Next time on Star Trek, the next generation. Tonight at 7 on KPTV 12. <laughs> Welcome back to the show, everybody, as we are uh, very close to uh, closing in on the opening kickoff between the Ducks and Hawaii. We will preview that game a little later in the show, but the Ducks have been working diligently the last three weeks to get ready for this opening game. Fall camp is a time of excitement, but also it's a time of long hours, sweat, and, you know, for the coaches and players, it's a very difficult time. Recently, Pat McGilvery spent a day with co-captain Jeff Cummins to see exactly what it's like during fall training camp. 
the fuel for another full day of football. Oregon senior defensive end Jeff Cummins loads up. His morning will be a little more demanding than a simple cup of coffee can handle. This is day five of daily doubles at the U of O, about the time when two-a-day practices leave a player at his most vulnerable, tired and sore, yet still expected to be better than yesterday. We're earning our scholarship check right now. So uh, this, is, uh, this is it, the beginning of a new day. The job starts with some treatment for aching knees and ankles. Wearing his 25 pounds of work clothes, Cummins can at least take comfort knowing it's not going to hit 90 degrees on this day. Coach Brooks has been telling us uh, the weather has been cooperating <laughs> with us because it's been so hot. He feels that the hotter the weather is, uh, the better shape we're going to be in. But uh, I think the, the rest of the team will agree with me and say that the weather is cooperating today. Cummins is a team captain. He's also an unofficial assistant coach. But since you didn't, you didn't make a move right away, you let him reset again. But he was up, that's when you make your move. Coach Sheffield said it best when he said that, you know, if I see something, go ahead and just step in. and Because and, he's not going to be able to catch everything. I mean, he's got three or four guys going at one time. I feel if there's any way that I can help them out in the future, um, I might as well take care of it now and try, try to get, done that, get that done now. It's been a relatively easy morning workout, but there's a long day ahead. Before you know it, we'll be back here out on the field again. Pad's still sweaty, smelling real good, but uh, at least the weather's cooperating today. That's the big thing. A big lunch is just a moment's rest because there are meetings to review the morning practice. Uh, Jack, if he gives you that much, if he gives you, if he opens on you that much, keep coming. If I'm going 110 percent all all the time, all day long. I'd be nothing right now for the second practice. I mean, I, you do have to pace yourself. Trying to make the hours on the field a little more enjoyable, Cummins can always be counted on for a few laughs. <laughs> you know, we, we cracked jokes back and forth, and Coach Brooks told us, uh, you know, yesterday and the day before, hey, you know, have some fun out there, but, but, but keep it within some kind of restrictions. We don't want you getting too crazy and too wild, but, but have some fun. So that's what we're trying to do. Oh, the fun's over. They just called my name. But the fun evaporates late in the afternoon. The offense and defense bang heads and tempers flare. Listen up, you guys, listen up. We got to keep our poise out there a little bit, all right? But, hey, we understand the aggressiveness, but like Coach said, man, we got to stop that shit once they get done. That got out of hand. You guys all know it got out of hand. That's the end of the day. I mean, we have a little mental preparation tonight, a few meetings, and then uh, hopefully get some time to go home and spend a, spend a few quality hours with my dog and... Uh, Laying on the couch watching TV at my house, but I don't know, we'll see. And, uh, the noodles. A huge dinner is followed by another meeting, and only then can Cummins call it a day. Almost 14 hours of football, sunrise to sunset, and he'll do it all again the next day. This is kind of time to relax. So that's uh, what we're going to do now, so sleep. Bye-bye. <laughs> Well, fall camp does get a little testy. Uh, you know, you get about four or five days into those daily doubles, and I think everybody gets a little testy. Well, it does, Todd, but uh, that's football, too. And uh, if you're not ready to go through some of that, uh, you're not really going to be ready to play a real football game either because uh, the real football games get a little testy, too. <laughs> well, the most relaxing time during the day during training camp is spent at the dining room table. Walt Fox says it takes a large menu to feed those big bodies. What eats 50 pounds of ham, 50 pounds of chicken, 30 pounds of pasta, 50 pounds of potatoes, and still has room for ice cream? The answer, of course, is the Oregon football team at dinner. Big guys can put away a lot of food, and so eating is serious business. What they eat is serious business for the coaches. Basically, what we're trying to do is keep their energy levels up. We're trying to practice them two times a day, take them through meetings where they're not falling asleep and things like that. So what we want to do is try to keep them with high energy, be able to sustain their practices and practices to the best of their ability. That means lots of high carbohydrate foods, plenty of protein, chicken, fish, and turkey, piles of salad, fruits, and vegetables. Tonight's menu included baked ham, chicken sandwiches, pasta, rice, fruit and salad, juice, iced tea, and milk to drink. Now, some of these big guys can put away as much as 5,000 calories a meal. They needed to get through daily doubles in the hot sun. Radcliffe says nutrition is just a part of the total fitness package. That includes working out, lifting weights, practice. 
He spends a lot of time trying to teach these guys good eating habits when they're away from the training table. Our philosophy, and, and the way I like to put it, is we want them to be able to, to live healthy and be fit even after they're done playing football here. The question is, what do the players think of the food? Well, most of them were too busy eating to answer any questions. And it's obvious they aren't going hungry. For the Oregon Football Preview Show, I'm Walt Fox. Well, Coach, uh, what was training table? Did you have training table when uh, you played uh, football? We had it. It was uh, a lot different, obviously, mm -hmm. Todd. Uh, certainly the pregame meals uh, with the old steak <laughs> yeah. and green peas and things uh, were different when uh, back in the days I wore leather helmets. <laughs> but uh, uh, now it's the carbo load yeah. uh, and, and a lot healthier food, uh, more nutritious, uh, certainly a better balanced diet, I think, than, uh, than what I ate or what we even fed our team 15 years ago. There's just a, a lot more uh, information available to uh, help supplement uh, the diet and uh, get the muscle development and, and recovery from uh, those hard work days on the practice field. Well, as the coach and I uh, head to the refrigerator for two minutes, uh, you watch these uh, commercials as our sponsors uh, let you know what's going on when we come back. We'll take a look at one of the veterans and some newcomers to the program. Well, for the past two seasons, the leading tackler for the Ducks has uh, been a slender inside linebacker, weighs just about 200 pounds, but he throws his body around like a missile. And according to Walt Fox, there's nobody on the team that would like to forget the last 12 months like Joe Farwell. Joe Farwell's number one goal for this year is to have fun. A losing season, an ankle injury, and sadly the death of his father made 1991 a season he wants to forget. For me, last season's just kind of in a dreamlike state anyways. It just, it, you know, it, it seems like a slideshow or something like that, but uh, I think everyone's really excited to uh, get back on the field and uh, just do away with the past and uh, get, get something good starting for the future. Farwell is a three-year starter for the Ducks. In fact, he started every game he's played at Oregon. Despite the fact he was hobbled by a bad ankle and played in only 10 games last season, he led the team in tackles, including 20 against the Beavers in the Civil War. Now, Farwell is not your prototype middle linebacker. At 6'2", 210, a lot of people would consider him undersized. But he's proven there's more to playing linebacker than being big. He has a lot of confidence in himself. Um, he works hard and, and and he does a good job. What I lose in weight, I guess, and, and strength, I think I can make up with quickness. So, I don't know. I, you'd be surprised what you could do in there if you really put your mind to it. Farwell has seen the best of times with the Ducks. He's played in two bowl games. In fact, the Freedom Bowl in 1990 was one of the best games of his career. He would like to end his career on a winning note and leave his mark on Oregon football. I think personally for myself, I think I want to just feel like I'm was one of the best linebackers in the Pac-10 this year. I mean, I think I've been good before. Last year was kind of, it was tough for everyone. So uh, I just want one more shot at it, and then, I'm, then I can hang them up for, for good. For the Oregon Football Preview Show, I'm Walt Fox. One heck of a football player, and we'll talk more about uh, Joe in the Coaches Show coming up this Sunday. Well, while Farwell is well known to Oregon fans, there are a host of fresh faces that you'll be hearing a lot about this upcoming season. Pat McGilvery has our introductions. They're the obscure names, the unfamiliar faces, but chances are you'll get to know some of these players on game days. For instance, offensive guard Mike DeFonzo. He's taken a roundabout way to Oregon, an imposing six foot four, 295 pounds. DeFonzo had a job, did not play high school football. Then it was a couple of years to Hawaii to, as he says, goof around a while. The 25-year-old DeFonzo explains what happened next. Came back, started working, and figured out work wasn't for me and school was. So decided to go back play football. Went to JC, played for a few years. They saw me on some film, and they offered me a scholarship. Just a junior, DeFonzo gives the Ducks added depth and strength in the offensive line. Redshirt freshman Alex Molden is about to join an exclusive club, players who've started for the Ducks in their first appearance in an Oregon uniform. Molden, a cornerback, is one of the fastest players on the team, and he says he's ready to make an impact. I'm not going to hold back here. I'm not going to, uh, you know, play soft. I, I want to play like, um, 
I wanted to, well, I don't want to play like a freshman. But the player with the most impact could be flanker Derek Deadweiler, a JC transfer he redshirted last year. Now, Deadweiler figures to be the Ducks' best breakaway threat. Deadweiler came to Oregon with his junior college teammate, quarterback Brett Salisbury. Well, Salisbury's gone, but Deadweiler's ready to get the ball and run with it. If I see anybody who doesn't have my color jersey on, I just try to dodge him. And, you know, basically what happens is I'm always running upfield. I, ne I never learned how to run east-west. I always learned how to run, you know, north-south because I was a, a running back at one time. And I figured me being a running back helped me be able to catch the ball and run with it afterwards because, I, you know, I just had to, you know, that focus on getting to the end zone. Deadweiler should have plenty of chances to head for the end zone as a flanker, kick returner, and even as an occasional running back. And true freshman Tony Graziani has been a quick learner at quarterback. Keeping in mind last year's quarterback injuries, Graziani's only a hit or two from playing time. But he's found out in a hurry this is nothing like high school. It's quicker, a lot quicker, and the defenses are tougher because they disguise a lot, lot more, and you know, you just gotta you gotta just you gotta read as everything's happening. There are a few other names you won't recognize. They'll introduce themselves as the season goes on. For the Oregon Football Preview Show, I'm Pat McGilvery. You know, I think that's part of the anticipation about the first game is some of these newcomers, they, whether they be redshirt freshmen, two, uh, true freshmen, junior college transfers, you're not really sure how they're going to perform that first game, and it's interesting to watch them the first game or two to see how they uh, you know, jump up as far as the level of competition. No question about it, Todd, <laughs> and uh, there will be a lot of new faces out there. Uh, some of them played uh, small roles last year, but they're... Uh, performance is going to increase a great deal, uh, their playing time, and I think you're going to see a lot of outstanding football from some of those players. Tony Coker would be an example, mm -hmm. mostly on special teams last year. He will start at outside linebacker against Hawaii Saturday. So there's going to be a lot of new faces, and I'm excited about them because their attitudes are good, and I think there's some excellent athletes with uh, tremendous ability. Well, it's going to be fun to watch them this year as uh, the Ducks March through the 1992 season. When we come back, we'll talk about the schedule and the Pac-10 conference race. Stick with us. Well, the Ducks have seven home games for the second time in three years. Now, the last time that happened, the Ducks won them all and went to a bowl game. Let's take a look at the upcoming schedule and the Pac-10 title chase. The Oregon defense will be tested from the start when the Rainbows visit. Junior quarterback Michael Carter directs the spread option offense that finished fifth in the nation in rushing and 23rd in total offense. Carter completed only 38% of his passes, but is most dangerous toting the pigskin. He rushed for almost 1,100 yards and 16 TDs. When Carter wasn't carrying the ball to the end zone, Kicker Jason Elam was booting it through. The man with the golden leg, as he is billed, holds just about every kicking record for the Rainbows, having hit 84% of his field goals. Defensively, Hawaii was racked with injury last season and went on to permit over 32 points a game. But this year, everybody is healthy. And Coach Bob Wagner says it's time to turn that 4-7-1 and one record around. I think we're making good progress. It's been a, a good, solid fall camp. Uh, we haven't had uh, in, an inordinate number of injuries. And that's gone pretty well for us. Uh, the guys have worked hard. So, uh, you know, things are shaping up pretty good. Week two, a trip to the farm and a date with Stanford. The news in Palo Alto these days is that Coach Bill Walsh is 0-1. The Cardinal opened the season in the Pigskin Classic and lost a defensive struggle to Texas A&M. Despite Walsh's presence, Stanford's strength is in its defense, thanks to bookend linebackers Ron George and Dave Garnett. Offensively, quarterback Steve Stenstrom led the conference in passing efficiency as a sophomore and should blossom under Walsh's wing. Glenn Milburn is one of the best all-purpose backs in the country and reminds many Stanford fans of former All-American Darren Nelson. The Cardinal tied for second last season, and according to Walsh, is a program on the way up. I think Stanford's on the rise. I think we'll be very competitive. I think it will be more competitive each year. And who's to say that three, four years from now, people won't link our name with a Rose Bowl somehow. I'm just hopeful that'll happen. Week three, and the Ducks complete a home-and-home -home series with the Red Raiders of Texas Tech. Last year's game in Lubbock may have been the highlight of the year for Duck fans. Danny O'Neill with four touchdown passes in a convincing victory. But the Red Raiders rallied to win five of their last six games and returned 14 starters. 
They're running Rebs of UNLV invade Autzen Stadium September 26th. The football team takes a back seat to basketball in the famous strip in this desert town. A year ago, the Rebs finished fifth in the Big West Conference, but 16 starters returned from a team that won four games. The next three games are pivotal to the Ducks' hopes. On the 3rd of October, the new-look Arizona State Sun Devils come to town. Former Duck Bruce Snyder signed a megabucks deal to jump from Cal to the desert. But Snyder's biggest concern is to improve team speed. We have some very fast players, but we're not very fast as a football team. Our tailbacks are very fast. We have fast wide receivers. But when you get to the offensive line, the linebackers, and some other areas in our team, we're not very fast. And oh, how times have changed for Southern California. The Trojans are celebrating the school's 100th team. Number 99 is one they'd like to forget, an untypical 3-8, and eight, including losses in the final six games. The Trojans sputtered on offense last season. Sophomore Rob Johnson will get the call as USC opens with road games at San Diego State, Oklahoma, and Washington. And there isn't an Oregon fan that hasn't circled October 17th on the calendar. That's when the defending national champion Washington Huskies return to Watson for the first time in four years. Coach Don James watched as 11 players were drafted into the NFL from last season's team. But this is a squad that's loaded again. In fact, the biggest headache James has is choosing a quarterback. Mark Brunel and Billy Joe Hobart are both Rose Bowl MVPs. And James says that both will play a lot. I don't know, number of snaps, uh, I, I think the key thing is we want to make sure that, uh, that our backup this year uh, gets a, a fairly good number of snaps. And I'm not sure if it's, you know, what, if it's 75, 25 or, or one third versus two thirds, it's, uh, it's really hard to predict just how we're going to end up doing this, but uh, we'll definitely uh, let both quarterbacks play. The Huskies have won 14 straight over two seasons and are trying to become the first team to ever win three straight Rose Bowls. Following a week off, the Ducks head down the home stretch with a stop in Pullman. The Cougars may have the most explosive offense in the league, with starters returning at every position. The trigger puller is junior quarterback Drew Bledsoe, who paced the conference in total offense. The month of November begins with a visit by the Cal Bears. Quarterback Mike Pulaski is gone, but tailback Russell White is back. White is a bona fide Heisman Trophy candidate after rushing for over 1,100 yards as a junior. White disdained the NFL draft for one more season in Strawberry Canyon. The Bears have been to consecutive bowl games, and with new coach Keith Gilbertson at the helm, they should contend for postseason honors again. November 14th, the final home game against UCLA. The Bruins, as always, possess some of the best skilled players on the West Coast. Tailback Kevin Williams led the Pac-10 in rushing as a junior and, when healthy, gives the Bruins a deep threat at all times. Wide receiver Sean LaChapelle may be the best at his position in the country. And cornerback Carlton Gray was second in the nation with 10 interceptions. But the Bruins will go only as far as their quarterback play after a surprising departure of Tommy Maddox. Just as Tommy came in and filled his role and, and did a great job for UCLA uh, once Troy Aikman left, I think Wayne Cook will come in and do a great job for UCLA now that Tommy Maddox has left. And I think he'll have a great year. The season concludes with a civil war in Corvallis. Under second-year coach Jerry Pettibone, the Beavers believe they will improve upon their 1-10 record. 19 starters return, including sophomore quarterback Mark Olford, who has demonstrated much better command of the spread option offense. The Beavers open with three straight at Parker Stadium and hope the momentum of last year's Civil War victory will continue. Well, now it's time to take a look at the first uh, major Saturday of activity in the Pac-10 Conference. Let's take a look at the schedule. You see the Beavers open up with Kansas at home. Arizona State will entertain Washington in the only conference game of the weekend. Utah State will visit Arizona, San Jose State at California. And in Southern California, Cal State Fullerton takes on UCLA. USC, a tough opener at San Diego State. And Montana, the Grizzlies, will visit Washington State. Coach, uh, your assessment of the Pac-10 uh, like everybody else, I imagine you'll say the Huskies are the team to beat. Well, I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to figure <laughs> that out. Uh, based on the way they played last year, based on who they have coming back, uh, the strength of their quarterback position, uh, the outstanding defense they have, they're the clear favorite, I would say. I'd say UCLA would have been in a position on paper coming in to, to be close to them, but with Maddox gone, I think that leaves a little bit of a question there for them. Uh, I don't see anybody not being better in this league. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we saw by the 
the clips and listen to the coaches. Uh, you know, if I was a fan, I'd just be excited to come watch any team play because this is a great, great league from top to bottom. Last year, the Huskies tied for the uh, national championship with Miami. Uh, Bill Walsh comes into the league this year. There's quality coaches everywhere. The folks on the West Coast have been saying for years and years the Pac-10 is uh, the best conference in the country. Do you think now that Washington has won a national championship and Walsh is in the league and, and other things, the success the teams have had in bowl games, that nationwide the Pac-10 will be recognized as, uh, if not the best, certainly one or two? Well, I, I think it's a little slow in coming. Uh, you look at the bowl records, you look at the players in the NFL, uh, there's no close, no, nobody that's close to the Pac-10 conference. We have many more players on NFL rosters. Our winning percentage in bowl, bowl games is greater than any other league in the, in the nation. Uh, I think we suffer a little bit because of the lateness of our games with the East Coast uh, media market. Uh, so I, I, I don't think that we will get quite the, uh, the recognition that this conference deserves, but uh, the teams that play us know darn good and well what kind of football we play in this league. Yeah, just take a look at the non-conference record over the years, and the Pac-10 is remarkable in winning those games. When we come back, we'll wrap things up and take a look at the Ducks' first opponent, University of Hawaii. Well, Coach, you start the 92 season with the University of Hawaii. It's been uh, four years since you played the Rainbows. Uh, give us your analysis of uh, what you think Hawaii will be like this year. Well, Hawaii is an outstanding football team, Todd. They, uh, they defeated Utah, uh, who defeated us last year, and they, they slaughtered them, I should say. They scored 52 points on Utah. They scored 42 on Notre Dame at the end of the season. They've been one of the top five teams in the nation at least three of the last four years in total offense. Uh, very explosive team, as you can see, and, and a, an unusual offense. Uh, we saw Arizona try to run mm -hmm. this offense in our league, but uh, Hawaii really runs it because they have the personnel to make it work. Uh, a quarterback that can run and throw, as you can see here. Uh, in fact, they have two quarterbacks, and they're, they're having a hard time deciding which one to play. Uh, they're, they're an explosive team, and they do everything under the sun on defense. Well, Coach, it'll be an interesting and certainly an exciting game here at Dotson Stadium at uh, 1 o'clock Saturday, and we want to wish you the best of luck. And, of course, you'll be with us all season long during the uh, coaches' shows that you'll be able to see around uh, the Pacific Northwest on your favorite station. So for the coach, I'm Todd McKim. Thank you very much for watching today, and uh, we certainly hope to see you at Dotson Stadium, the Ducks and the Rainbows. Good night, everybody.